Okay. Okay. So I'm Chris Dunford, and I've been president of Freedom from Hunger now for uh, over 20 years. Uh, I just stepped down to become senior researcher. The, uh, as the name suggests, our focus is on people who are so poor that they're chronically hungry. In other words, they're struggling to get enough good quality food throughout the year to lead a healthy, productive life. And uh, it's important to realize that these people aren't suffering from catastrophic famine, so they don't need feeding. What they need is support for their self-help efforts. And they have a couple of really important assets uh, that we think uh, outsiders can build on to support their self-help. One is the resilience and resourcefulness that comes from uh, the human spirit. Uh, and the, they have each other. Uh, the social solidarity and mutual aid that makes it possible for them to survive in conditions. That, well, to survive in conditions where they're uncertain as to whether they're going to get enough so the question for, for me, for freedom from hunger, for most people I think are concerned with the chronic recovery for is, you know, how can we intervene, if you want to call it that, from the outside in such a way that it supports their self-help assets rather than crushes them. And so, you know, what we think is, is kind of a universal solution or has a huge uh, need for adaptation to different cultural and environmental contexts. But, but what seems to work best is money and information and access to whatever services, good quality services are available, particularly microfinance, um, education, you know, it's really practical, designed for illiterate adults, uh, and uh, you know, access to the health and you know, other related services that uh, support the, the one major asset that the poor have, which is their own bodies. Uh, so I'm not sure that we've seen, well, I should say that over the 20, 25 years, working on that, even though we're a 65-year-old organization, the last 25 years is focused on, on providing that combination of microfinance, education, and health. And the, the real challenge for us is how do you package that in such a way that it can deliver to a very large number of people, uh, rather than just you know, a good pilot, uh, pilot project. Because we're talking about a billion people who are chronically hungry, so the challenge is how can you build something that's robust enough to, uh, to be useful to people in India or Africa, or the high Andes, or down the tropical lowlands of Latin America, or other parts of the Philippines. Um, I think it's fairly remarkable how similar the lives are of people when they're very poor. They basically have fewer and fewer options to poor and poor and get. So, you know, regardless of the environmental culture, they tend to have some real, you know, some basic features in common. And so, we found that this combination of microfinance education and health is, is pretty robust. Figure out a way to deliver it <laughs> in, in a way that uh, is financially sustainable. <laughs> yeah. Wow, a billion people! You really think this is a model that can is relevant to create solutions for the billion uh, well, hungry people? I mean, we have to create positive models where we can. It's not enough to create a positive model. We have to figure out how to make it scalable. And even then, when you create really large-scale models, uh, you know, reaching. Uh, in some countries like India, where it's relatively easy to reach a million people, that's still a drop in the bucket when you're considering a billion. And, and the huge variety of contexts and the contexts are different, not so much because of culture and environment, so much as because of the different institutional contexts and economies mm -hmm. uh, and political economies in general. How can you, how can you sort of spread this in such a way that it'll become sort of a commonplace within the international development toolkit? Uh, and so it has to go beyond developing a great prototype to uh, and generating the evidence that it works to having really large-scale demonstrations, and then you got to somehow communicate those. You got you to make the world aware of them and overcome you know, some of the, the negative narratives about things like integration or more recently microfinance or, or whatnot. So, 65-year-old organization, 25 years. 20 years yourself personally, where are you on that uh, spectrum? I mean, are you a pilot or a large-scale pilot? Or? Large, we're getting to the point where we have some really large-scale demonstrations with considerable evidence that it works, but at the same time, you know, it, one of the problems we're running into uh, is that the evidence isn't enough. I mean, people who basically have a fundamental bias against, say, integrating microfinance with health uh, or vice versa, uh, you know, this. They can always point to gaps in the evidence. You know, it's like the, the climate change argument. You know, you can always point to gaps in the evidence and say, well, you know, we can't take action until we have more evidence. Uh, so that's a huge challenge is, you know, what constitutes good evidence? Uh, 
uh, there's all sorts of, of issues involved. all, but uh, yeah, we're at that stage where we've got some very large scale examples. I mean, for instance, we're, we have a staff of about 48 people. They're working with 132 microfinance institutions and non-financial institutions around the, in, in, eight, in 19 countries now. And, uh, and they're reaching 3.2 million women, okay? And, and some of those are you know, programs that are approaching a million each. So, uh, um, and, and if you count the family members of those 3.2 million, then that's you know, something like 18 million. So even at that scale, it's just a demonstration. You know, even at 19 countries, it's just a demonstration. So our challenge is how do you get beyond demonstration to wide-scale acceptance that this is a standard tool in the toolkit. Wow, thank you. Sure.